parliamentary colleagues, distinguished members of the British Indian diaspora, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Royal Gallery. It is my enormous pleasure now to introduce Narendra Modi, the 15th Prime Minister of India. Today is special, and it's special for two reasons. First, this is a first, the first occasion upon which we will hear a speech by a serving Indian Prime Minister in our parliament. Secondly, it is fitting that it takes place during Diwali with the resonance which that entails for millions across this country, in India, and indeed throughout the world. What's more, today is New Year's Day. Sal Mubarak. Happy New Year. <laughs> the ties between our two countries are so multiple, deep, and enduring that they frankly require no elaboration or rehearsal this afternoon. Skeptics sometimes suggest that democracy is all but impossible to create or to maintain in countries of a certain size, degree of diversity, or level of economic development. Over the past 68 years, India has proved to be a standing rebuke to such skeptics. To rout the disbelievers completely, however, democracy has to demonstrate that it can respect free speech and incorporate a true diversity of creeds, faiths, and orientations without diminishing or disrespecting any of them. With some 1.3 billion people and a burgeoning young population, India will become the most populous nation on our planet well within the lifetimes of many people here present. And it is destined to become a leader in the world. Put bluntly, India is all of our futures. Preparing for such a prospect is a daunting challenge to which Prime Minister Modi has devoted great thought and attention. Friends and colleagues, Mr Modi is known in Indian circles as Mr Tech. He pioneered the expansion of the internet in Gujarat during his lengthy tenure as Chief Minister there. And in the past 18 months in Delhi, he has established a digital India scheme and indeed created a network of smart cities. He has an astonishing 12 million followers on Twitter, and he is extremely comfortable communicating with fellow citizens via the medium of Google Hangouts on Android Lollipop. In a spirit of friendly competition, I'm sure that our own leaders in all parties will now strive to follow your example, sir. <laughs> Mr. Modi has recently returned from taking Silicon Valley by storm, holding talks with, amongst others, Mr. Mark Zuckerberg of Facebook. It is reasonable to assume, Prime Minister, that you will find events today in this historic setting something of a contrast. The contrast is not, however, a contradiction. We welcome you today, not principally in order to commemorate the past, but rather to herald the present and to gaze to the future. Prime Minister, thank you for coming. It is my pleasure to invite you to speak to us. Lord Speaker, Mr. Speaker, 
Mr. Prime Minister, I'm delighted to be in London. Even in this globalized world, London is still the standard of our times. The city has embraced the world's diversity and represent the finest in human achievements. And I'm truly honored to speak in the British Parliament. Mr. Speaker, thank you for opening the doors to us here in this magnificent setting of the Royal Court. I know that the Parliament is not in session. Prime Minister Cameron looks relaxed and relieved. <laughs> <laughs> but I want to remind you, Mr. Prime Minister, that you owe my loyalty for an election slogan. I know that you are hosting me at the checkers this evening. But I also know that you will understand if I am fair to both sides of the floor, especially since British MPs of Indian origin are evenly balanced between the Treasury and the opposition benches. So I also extend my good wishes to the Labour. Indeed, since these are still early days after the election, my warm congratulations to the members of the House and greetings to the eminent leaders of Britain and great friends of India present here today. So much of the modern history of India is linked to this building. So much history looms across our relationship. There are others who have spoken forcefully on the dates and dues of history. I will only say that many freedom fighters of India found their calling in the institutions of Britain. And many makers of modern India, including several of my distinguished predecessors, from Jawaharlal Nehru to Dr. Manmohan Singh, passed through their doors. There are many things on which it is hard to tell anymore if they are British or Indian. The Jaguar of the Scotland Yard, for example, the Brookbond Tea, or my friend, late Lord Gulam Noons Curry, and our strongest debates are whether the Lord's pitch swings unfairly or the wicket at Eden Garden cracks too early. And we love the Bhangra rap from London, just as you like the English novel from India. On the way to this event, Prime Minister Cameron and I paid homage to Mahatma Gandhi outside the parliament. I was reminded of a question I was asked on a tour abroad. How is it that the statue of Gandhi stands outside the British Parliament? To that question, my answer is, the British are wise enough to recognize his greatness. Indians are generous enough to share him. We are both fortunate enough 
to have been touched by his life and mission. And we are both smart enough to use the strengths of our connected histories to power the future of our relationship. So I stand here today not as a visiting head of government given the honor to speak in this temple of democracy. I'm here as a representative of a fellow institution and a shared traditions. And tomorrow, Prime Minister and I will be at the Wembley. Even in India, every young footballer wants to bend it like Beckham. <laughs> Wembley will be a celebration of one half million threads of life that binds us. One and half million people proud of their heritage in India, proud of their home in Britain. It will be an expression of joy for all that we share. Values, institutions, political system, sports, culture, and art. And it will be a recognition of a vibrant partnership and a shared future. The United Kingdom is the third largest investor in India behind Singapore and Mauritius. India is the third largest source of foreign direct investment projects in the United Kingdom. Indians invest more in Britain than in the rest of European Union combined. It is not because they want to save an interpretation cost, but because they find an environment that is welcoming and familiar. It takes an Indian icon, Tata, to run a British icon and become your nation's largest private sector employer. The UK remains a preferred destination for India students. And I'm pleased that an Indian company is taking a thousand British students to India to skill them in information technology. We are working together in the most advanced area of science and technology. We are finding solutions to the enduring human problems of food and health security and seeking answer to emerging challenges like climate change. Our security agencies work together so that our children return home safe and our increasingly network lives are not prey to the threats on cyberspace. Our armed forces exercise with each other so that they can stand more strongly for the values we represent. This year alone, we have had three exercises together. And in the international arena, your support has made it more possible for India to take her rightful place in global institutions and regimes. And it has helped us both advance our common interests. Mr. Speaker, strong as our partnership is for relationship such as ours, we must set higher ambitions. We are two democracies, two strong economies, and two innovative societies. We have the comfort of familiarity and the experience of a long partnership. Britain's resurgence is impressive. Its influence on the future of the global economy remains strong. And Mr. Speaker, India is a new bright spot of hope and opportunity for the world. It is not just the universal judgment of international institutions. 
it is not just the logic of numbers. A nation of 1.25 billion people with 800 million under the age of 35 years. This optimism comes from the energy and enterprise of our youth, eager to, for change and confident of achieving it. It is the result of bold and sustained measures to reform our laws, policies, institutions, and processes. We are igniting the engines of our manufacturing sector, making our farms more productive and more resilient, making our services more innovative and efficient, moving with urgency on building global skills for our youth, creating a revolution in startup enterprises and building the next generation infrastructure that will have a light footprint on the earth. Our momentum comes not just from the growth we pursue, but from the transformation that we seek in the quality of life for every citizen. Much of India that we dream of still lies ahead of us. Housing, power, water and sanitation for all, bank accounts and insurance for every citizen, connected and prosperous villages and smart and sustainable cities. These are goals with a definite date, not just a mirage of hope. And inspired by Gandhiji, the change has begun with us the way the government works. There is transparency and accountability in governance. There is boldness and speed in decisions. Federalism is no longer the fault line of center-state relation, but the definition of a new partnership of Team India. Citizens now have the ease of trust, not the burden of proof and processes. Business find an environment that is open and easy to work in. In a nation connected by cell phones, Digital India is transforming the interface between government and people. So, Mr. Speaker, with apologies to poet T.S. Eliot, we, we would not let the shadow fall between the idea and reality. If you visit India, you will experience the weed of change. It is reflected in the surge of investments from around the world enhanced stability of our economy. In 190 million new bank accounts of hope and inclusion, in the increase in our growth to nearly 7.5% per year, and in the sharp rise in our talk, take, ranking on ease of doing business. And the motto of Sapka Saath, Sapka Vikas is our vision of a nation in which every citizen belongs, participates, and prospers. It is not just a call for economic inclusion. It is also a celebration of a diversity, the creed for social harmony, and a commitment to individual liberties and rights. This is the timeless ethos of our culture. This is the basis of our constitution, and this will be the foundation of our future. Mr. Speaker, members and friends, the progress of India is the destiny of one sixth humanity, and it will also mean a world more confident of its prosperity and more secure about its future. It is also natural and inevitable 
that our economic relations will grow by leaps and bounds. We'll form unbeatable partnership if we combine our unique strength and the size and the scale of opportunities in India. We will see more investment and trade. We will open new doors in the service sector. We will collaborate more here and in India in defense equipment and technology. We will work together on renewable and nuclear energy. We will explore the mysteries of science and harness the power of technology and innovation. We will realize the opportunities of the digital world. Our youth will learn more from and with each other. But a relationship as rich as this with so much promise as ours cannot be measured only in terms of our mutual prosperity. Mr. Speaker, ours is an age of multiple transition in the world. We are yet to fully com comprehend the future unfolding before us. As in the previous ages, it will be different from the world we know. So in the uncharted waters of our uncertain times, we must together help steer a steady course of this world in the direction that mirrors the ideals we share. For in that lies not just the success of our two nations, but also the promise of the world that we desire. We have the strength of our partnership and the membership of the United Nations, the Commonwealth, and the G20. We live in a world where instability in a distant region quickly reaches our doorsteps. We see this in the challenges of radicalization and refugees. The fault lines are shifting from the boundaries of nations into the web of our societies and the streets of our cities. And terrorism and extremism are a global force that are larger than their changing names, groups, territories, and targets. The world must speak in one voice and act in unison to combat this challenge of our times. We must adopt a comprehensive Convention on International Terrorism in the United Nations without delay. There should be no distinction between terrorist groups or discrimination between nations. There should be a resolve to isolate those who harbor terrorists and willingness to stand with nations that will fight them honestly. And we need a social movement against extremism in countries where it is most prevalent and every effort to de-link religion and terrorism. Oceans remain vital for our prosperity. Now we have to also secure our cyber and outer space. Our interests are aligned across many regions. We have a shared interest in stable, prosperous, an integrated South Asia round together in a shared march to prosperity. We want an Afghanistan that is shaped by the dreams of the great Afghan people, not by irrational fears and overreaching ambitions of others. A peaceful, stable Indian Ocean region is vital for global commerce and prosperity. And the future of Asia-Pacific region will have profound impact on all of us. We both have huge stakes in West Asia and the Gulf. And in Africa, where amidst many challenges, we see so many promising signs of courage, wisdom, leadership, and enterprise. India has just held an Africa summit in which all 55 countries 
and 42 leaders participated. We must also cooperate to launch a low-carbon age for a sustainable future for our planet. This is a global responsibility that we must assume in Paris later this month. The world has crafted a beautiful balance of collective action, common but differentiated responsibility, and respective capabilities. Those who have the means and the know-how must help meet the universal aspirations of humanity for clean energy and a healthy environment. And when we speak of restraint, we must not only think of curbing fossil fuels, but also moderating our lifestyles. We must all do our part. For India, a target of 175 gigawatt of additional capacity in renewable energy by 2022 and reduction in emission intensity of 33 to 35 percent by 2030 are just two of the steps of a comprehensive strategy. I have also proposed to launch during the COP21 meeting an international solar alliance to make solar energy an integral part of our lives, even in the most unconnected villages. In Britain, we are more like to use an umbrella against rain than the sun. But my team defined the membership of the Solar Alliance in more precise terms. We have to, to be located within the tropics, and we are pleased that the United Kingdom qualifies. So we look forward to an innovative Britain as a valuable partner in this endeavor. Prime Minister Cameron and I are indeed very pleased that cooperation and affordable and accessible clean energy is an important pillar of our relations. Mr. Speaker, this is a huge moment for our two great nations. So we must seize our opportunities, remove the ob obstacles to cooperation, instill full confidence in our relations and remain sensitive to each other's interests. In doing so, we will transform our strategic partnership and we will make this relationship count as one of the leading global partnerships. Ever so often in the call of Britain's most famous bar, that we must siege the tide in the affairs of man, the world has sought the inspiration to act, and so must we. But in defining the purpose of our partnership, we must turn to a great son of India whose house in London I shall dedicate to the cause of social justice on Saturday. Dr. B. R. Ambedkar, whose 125th birth anniversary we are celebrating now, was not just an architect of India's constitution and our parliamentary democracy. He also stood for the upliftment of the weak, the oppressed, and the excluded. And he lifted us all to a higher cause in the service of humanity, to build a future of justice, equality, opportunity, and dignity for all humans and peace among people. That is the cause to which India and the United Kingdom have dedicated themselves today. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot.
Prime Minister Modi, thank you on behalf of everyone assembled and particularly on behalf of the House of Lords for your inspired and inspiring speech. Your presence here today gives Parliament a valuable opportunity to celebrate the unique relationship between the UK and India. And how appropriate to do so here <clears throat> in the Royal Gallery, where 85 years ago today, King George V opened the first London Roundtable Conference. Prime Minister Modi, it's been a great pleasure to host you here in Parliament. 